Hello everyone. Welcome to Dissidents and Dictators, the Human Rights Foundation's conversation series where we expose dictators, debate pressing global human rights issues, and brainstorm how we can collectively put human rights at the top of the world agenda. My name is Ayame, and I'm a Legal and Policy Fellow at the Human Rights Foundation. HRF is an international, non-partisan, non-profit organization dedicated to promoting and protecting human rights globally with a focus on countries under authoritarian rule. We unite people in the common cause of promoting liberal democracy. You may visit our website, hrf.org, to learn more about the work we do. Please also uh, make sure to follow us on Twitter for more conversations like the one that we will be holding today. Previous guests include human rights and anti-corruption activist Bill Browder, Rohingya Burmese activist and former political prisoner Wei Wei Nu, Russian democracy activist Vladimir Karamutsa, and many more. Before you get, we begin, please note that this conversation will be recorded to be released as a podcast in the future. We'll have time at the end for questions, but we caution, but we caution any particip anyone participating today that if you have security concerns to use anonymity on your account profile, and if you want to speak, you have the option to voice your opinions without personal identifiers. Thank you for your understanding. Our guests this week are Washington Post journalist and columnist Josh Bergen and Hong Kong activist Sunny Chung and Anna Kwok from the Hong Kong Democracy Council. HKDC is the first Washington DC nonprofit dedicated to advocating for Hong Kong and Hong Kongers, founded in 2019 by Hong Kongers amid the pro-democracy movement. Today's discussion will highlight the Chinese government's ongoing tactics of stifling civil liberties and freedoms in Hong Kong. Earlier this month marked the 25th anniversary of the handover of Hong Kong to China, as well as the second anniversary of the Chinese government's implementation of the national security law in Hong Kong. The national security law criminalizes vaguely identified actions such as sedition and subversion, which can be used broadly to imprison activists and opposition politicians. Ever since this draconian national security law, the space for civil society, political participation and freedoms have severely shrunk. Thank you for tuning into Hong Kong today here on Twitter Spaces. We will have a Q&A session at the end. If you have any questions, please directly DM me here at hrf underscore cm. Thank you so much for joining us, Josh, Sunny, and Anna. It's a pleasure to have you here with us today. Josh, I'll pass it on to you. Thank you so much, Ayami, and thanks to all of you uh, for joining us today. Uh, we're really um, honored and pleased to have uh, two speakers who are both not only uh, young activists and champions of democracy and freedom, but are also now building, helping to build awareness uh, and infrastructure to support uh, the many uh, Hong Kongers who are both uh, imprisoned inside of Hong Kong and also exiled around the world, uh, Sonny Chung and Anna Kwok. Uh, what we're going to do here is I'm going to start off with some questions to each of our speakers and uh, then at, toward the end we'll have plenty of time for uh, questions from you. Uh, the listeners. So uh, if you could um, get your questions ready and be prepared to use the hand raising feature and we'll call on you when that time comes. Uh, Sonny, let me start with you. Um, here we are. I think what the the best way to probably start is at the end and to tell update some of our listeners who may not have been following the latest uh, in the news from Hong Kong. Uh, what happened uh, exactly about two weeks ago on July 1st, which is traditionally a, 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 a landmark day for uh, uh, civil society and activists in Hong Kong, but it has now been turned into a, 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 a display of the crackdown and of the repression. Tell us what happened on July 1st this year in Hong Kong, uh, both with the inauguration of the new chief executive officer and also the visit of Chinese President Xi Jinping. And what should we take away from that day and what uh, what does it mean? Sure. Thank you, Josh. And also thank you, uh, HRF, for organizing this uh, amazing panel to highlight Hong Kong situation once again. So I met with Josh, I mean, in 2019, 
when the Hong Kong movement uh, was at its peak, uh, and also we had a delegation, we had so many delegations to visit Washington D.C. to encourage the U.S. Congress and the uh, U.S. government to support and stand with stand with Hong Kong people uh, at that moment. So um, three years already, and as George mentioned uh, two weeks ago, um, the July first, uh, it, it marked uh, the twenty fifth. Uh, anniversaries of Hong Kong handover from the British government to the Chinese regime, and on that day, um, perhaps many of you already uh, uh, know that um, Communist Party uh, leader Xi Jinping finally, I mean, in two years, left mainland China and to come to Hong Kong to celebrate uh, this uh, anniversary. And of course, there are so many political implications uh, behind that. And the most prominent one must be um, Xi Jinping here uh, was to send a very strong signal that he successfully cracked down on Hong Kong civil society and political activism that really uh, appeased uh, um, the Communist Party leaders and the members and also demonstrate that um, through the national security laws and other means, uh, like such, such as uh, uh, the Hong Kong police force, they uh, try to eradicate the room for political opposition in Hong Kong. And this actually becomes one of the biggest achievements under Xi Jinping rules uh, of his uh, CCP career as a leader to seek for another term as a Communist Party leader. So the demise of Hong Kong civil society and uh, political autonomy really uh, uh, have another uh, important message that uh, we should not uh, let CCP uh, 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 being uh, that uh, uh, rampant to, to, um, to undermine our autonomy. We should do everything we can to hold China accountable. So another important message is that uh, two weeks ago in, uh, on July 1st, we have our new executive. This new executive, uh, chief executive, um, is quite uh, someone that we um, might not anticipate if you ask us like uh, a decade ago. Because, because Hong Kong is famous uh, for as an international financial hub. Uh, we, we, ha we had a very good um, civil servant team and then uh, we, uh, we, we were famous of our very efficient uh, government and, and a very strong uh, uh, administrative team uh, uh, in Hong Kong to uh, benefit and also facilitate all kind of economic activities uh, uh, and also uh, uh, trades uh, in Asia. However, our new chief executive, uh, he, John Lee, he has zero experience in public administration. Instead, uh, he was a man with a gun uh, who was a police officer and also throughout his whole career. And then uh, he helped uh, the police uh, department and also the security bureau to uh, arrest activists, to crack down on Hong Kong civil society. And now he uh, is being appointed at, as the new chief executive. And this by itself already illustrates that uh, Xi Jinping wants someone that can really uh, uh, handle the national security issue to ensure Hong Kong will, uh, will keep its uh, so-called harmony and peace uh, without this kind of political op opposition. And one other example I would love to raise is that um, when this new chief executive, John Lee, uh, uh, I mean, uh, holds the power, and then he immediately announced that he will try, uh, by all means, he will try uh, to, of course, ensure that uh, political opposition uh, shall not rise again, and he will, by all means, to ensure that national security uh, will be protected uh, under the national security laws and by other new measures, such as they are going to introduce a new cyber law, cyber security law, uh, in the coming legislative council terms. And this is really quite uh, worrying because uh, in Hong Kong, we, uh, we never have any uh, uh, cyber security regulation before. And we can imagine that uh, when Hong Kong becomes quite similar to uh, uh, mainland China, or even someone will claim that actually Hong Kong will become more like Xinjiang and call that Xinjiangization. 
and by the news uh, sub executive law actually we can observe a pattern that they are going to uh, um regulate uh, our cyber domain and also uh, social media and they also want to introduce and ratify a law that can uh, regulate the so-called fake news and under autocratic regime this kind of laws uh, can be very arbitrary and actually only facilitates their crackdown they can define fake news uh, by their own ways they can define national security in their own ways and then um, that can also really uh, harm the hong kong uh, international reputation and also try to hinder and deter international business sector to enter Hong Kong, uh, try to utilize Hong Kong as a financial hub. So I think I will stop here. But I think that also provides a very brief overview to show that uh, how Xi Jinping cracked down on Hong Kong and how this new, new chief executive, his background and experience and his upcoming policy might affect Hong Kong in a very negative way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Sunny. And we'll get to all of that. You've brought up a bunch of different subjects. We'll get to them one by one. First, I want to give Anna an opportunity uh, to open with the same question. What was your reaction to uh, the July 1st events and Xi Jinping's visit? And we all saw the photo. What was that photo of uh, him giving his speech to an empty room? Sometimes they say a, a picture uh, speaks a thousand words. What was What's up with that? Why was Xi Jinping talking to a completely empty room? If you know, thank you. Right. Uh, so first of all, thank you, uh, Human Rights Foundation, for inviting me to speak today and to speak on Hong Kong. And uh, I think Josh poses a very interesting question is that there was this photo of Xi Jinping speaking to literally, you know, nobody in a, uh, in a, in a venue. But then he was uh, broadcasted to be delivering a speech for July 1st. And that is supposed to be the reason why he traveled all the way to Hong Kong, right? But the actual occasion had no audience. So I think that really shows that even though Xi Jinping did make the trip to Hong Kong, he actually still fundamentally uh, does not trust Hong Kong as a safe place. And that is also exemplified by um, how Xi Jinping did not actually stay overnight in Hong Kong. So th that was actually quite an interesting and an ongoing joke uh, between Hong Kongers that he traveled to Hong Kong and he was supposed to be there for two days for two uh, different programs. But instead of staying in a hotel in Hong Kong, he just chose to travel back to Shenzhen, which is more in the uh, traditional mainland China territory. And then he traveled back to Hong Kong the other day during the daytime uh, to do his programs. So he's really living the commuter life between Shenzhen and Hong Kong. And that was quite a weird scene to see. But that, again, I think uh, really speaks to how the CCP and Xi Jinping in general does not trust Hong Kong. And they do think that Hong Kong still has this element of opposition that can potentially challenge the rule, the authoritarian rule of the CCP. And I think that is also why with John Lee and with the new government officials, I think Sunny summarized really well on the several policies that they have been trying to introduce. And I think to analyze it on a more generic level, uh, in my opinion, there are really three major uh, goals that they're trying to reach. So the first one is that I think they're trying to destruct all the network uh, that they can find in Hong Kong because network is essentially what's the most important for activism and movement. I remember when I was studying in uh, university, there was a course about uh, movement and it said that people would be more readily mobilized to join a protest if they have friends and family and you know people in their network going than just for purely ideological you know, uh, um, understanding. And that's why I think uh, the CCP saw that. They saw that, you know, the human bonding or uh, the genuine network between people is actually the most fundamental thing that uh, showed the world how united Hong Kongers were in 2019. And that's why they're really afraid that if such network uh, allows to exist, you know, in the future or continually, that we would see another mass movement just like 2019. And that's why over the past years, you see the government trying to crack down and dismantle on all, all the organizations that they can find with a potential uh, to, 
you know, start any campaigns. And also they're going, they're stopping and eradicating all press platforms. For example, uh, what Sunny said about the cybersecurity law is actually just another means to make sure that there is no flow of information that people cannot construct the imagined uh, community that they can form together, even though people are, you know, in different places around the world or even in different places in Hong Kong. So that's definitely the first thing that I think the CCP is trying to do uh, in Hong Kong. And secondly, I think uh, CCP is really trying to spread fear. So by spreading fear, that is a very important and very um, powerful, actually, device to stop people from doing anything. And how they spread fear is not only by saying that, you know, the consequences of speaking up against the CCP is very hefty, but they are also using very sensationalized stories to uh, make sure that the message get across that um, uh, so recently there was a prosecution and an arrest uh, made on one of the more prominent uh, protesters in Hong Kong. And actually the government official came out and, and actually said a very, very um, compelling story, I would say, and sensational, a sensationalized story about how this protester had to, you know, find a place to uh, hide for uh, two, one to two years and how he had to go through so many, you know, uh, some uh, so many processes that were similar to human trafficking and how he could not eat and he had to starve just because he was scared of being prosecuted by the police and just because of how he was abused by other people in the pro-democracy camp. So with stories like that, the party is really trying to construct this image and paint this image of the pro-democracy camp being a very, um, I would say, a very... Um, dangerous, unhealthy, and toxic circle that can brainwash people into doing things that are against their own interests. So I think the CCP is re really trying to spread fear among Hong Kongers and our next generations to ensure that nobody will be thinking of starting a movement again or doing anything. So these are just some things that, you know, I, I think the CCP has been trying to do in Hong Kong to really deteriorate the freedoms uh, that we used to see back then. Thank you so much. Uh, fascinating. Can I just stay with you for one more uh, uh, question? Because uh, I'm genuinely curious, what is the status of the uh, freedom democracy movement inside Hong Kong? Has it gone underground? Is it still, are the networks still, do they exist? Are they uh, able to do anything to uh, mitigate the downside uh, of what's going on there? And, uh, you know, what, how have they adapted? Right. Uh, that's a really good question. And I think for that question, so firstly, a lot of uh, most important network connectors, they have been arrested. So in the movement, I think there are particular set of people who are used to, you know, connecting one circle of people to another circle, and they know, you know, what people are uh, the best in and what their strengths in, so they can kind of match the human resource with the right resource. And I think most of these network connectors have been arrested. So um, it's fair to say that the general political organizing network has been quite dismantled, that uh, there are only, I think, a handful of people left who are willing to, uh, who, who have the uh, experience to do anything. But then the thing is, uh, they have to, they are forced to go underground because right now, if you even, if you know, just by posting something on Facebook, you can get arrested, you can get a knock on your door the next day, and then you don't know what's going to happen next. So the price is too huge for people to be open and public about what they're doing. But even with that said, I think a lot of Hong Kongers are still, uh, even when they're inside of Hong Kong, still finding ways uh, to continue the movement and continue the organizing. So I cannot really go into the specifics, but I think um, sometimes you can even see on the news or on the uh, media that pe some people are still uh, so pr uh, so brave enough to go out and protest and to say something about the government. So I think that's really incredible. And you know, even without mass movements, I remember on July 1st, I saw the news of how uh, the Chinese government flags have been vandalized by people uh, because the government has been trying to put a lot of Chinese flags around just to make it look like Hong Kong is celebrating a handover. But of course, we're not, right? And uh, a lot of Hong Kongers try to vandalize the flags like brick, uh, uh, or steal, steal them or something. And I think even with uh, little acts like that, 
people are trying to tell the outside world that they're still there, they're still fighting, and uh, the movement is not dead. And I really want our audience here and the world to recognize today that, you know, people are still there, even though they're not as loud as before, but it's not because they don't want to be. It's just that they're waiting for the right moment. And uh, one more point to note is just that I think a lot of our friends uh, back then uh, had been very traumatized by what went down, including, you know, seeing our own friends getting arrested and how everyone had to go into exile. So some people are also taking the time they need uh, to really heal themselves and to see what the next steps are. But uh, to summarize, once again, people are still there and trying to find uh, what the next step is. But we still we just have to be a bit more patient and seeing uh, what can be next for you know the world to see. Very interesting. Thank you. Well, let me bring that back to you, Sunny, because while the movement inside Hong Kong uh, is hunkering down for really uh, understandable reasons, um, the the leaders in the movement who have spread out all over the world are building a new infrastructure for a new exile community. And of course, Hong Kong Democracy Council is an important part of that. Uh, tell us what, how that's going. What, what's your theory of the case? How are these organizations working together? And uh, what's, what's, what are the top uh, two or three initiatives that you've got going right now? Sure. Uh, I think that is a very good question. I mean, uh, over the years, I mean, Hong Kong situation changed a lot, so we have to evolve uh, uh, from 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 our very, I mean, uh, original position. In 2019, uh, we, uh, I mean, we 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 try so hard to push forward the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act, which I'm mean, uh, Josh is also uh, very familiar with the situation, and um, we 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 spent uh, 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 several months um, having a lot of delegations, and the movement in Hong Kong uh, was also a very uh, uh, I, I mean, I mean, provide a lot of momentum uh, in the hill, trying to push forward the legislation and not just the Human Rights and Democracy Act, but also the Hong Kong Autonomy Act and other uh, 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 resolutions and other uh, uh, executive means in order to hold uh, Hong Kong officials and Chinese officials accountable. So uh, over the three years, uh, a lot of Hong Kong officials are being sanctioned already. However, of course, I mean, we might be skeptical about the effectiveness uh, if we try to, uh, 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 I mean, examine the Hong Kong situation or, or we try to define the victory by reclaiming Hong Kong uh, tomorrow or within the next couple of years. Then you might argue that, I mean, the sanction is not that effective and Xi Jinping is still doing whatever he wants uh, to crack down the Hong Kong civil society and arrest all the people he hates. Uh, in Hong Kong civil society. However, I think it's still a very uh, uh, strong move uh, by the U.S. administration uh, uh, to to send a signal uh, uh, to uh, the Beijing government that uh, Hong Kong uh, uh, is some is a topic by itself that uh, should be uh, 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 that, that the focus of uh, the U.S. government and also uh, uh, the policy making of uh, many fewer countries. So now the Hong Kong uh, Democracy Council. Uh, we uh, despite um, the sanction, we also try to uh, have a lot of uh, uh, advocacy uh, recommendation, and I think of course Anna can supplement uh, uh, on this issue. So I will just waste one example. First of all, uh, when we talk about how to uh, uh, deter uh, 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 the Chinese influence in Hong Kong, we want to also work with private sector because when we witness how the Russia tried to invade Ukraine. And then we witness how many tech companies like Google, Facebook, they are actually joining the fight and trying to uh, counter the disinformation, uh, helping uh, Ukraine to counter Russian uh, influence and trying to build a lot of fact checks uh, centers and using a lot of means to disseminate the correct information. So for the HKDC, we are actively considering how to explore ways to work with the private sector. And of course, not just the Hong Kong groups. I mean, previously, when uh, when we talk about the Uyghurs and Tibetans, they have been trying a lot to work with the private sector to boycott the Beijing Olympic, Winter Olympics, right? They want to waste the uh, uh, social uh, uh, responsibility among this kind of uh, huge tech companies and, and enterprises uh, to, to fulfill their duty to become a responsible stakeholder in the community. And in Hong Kong also, because as mentioned, uh, perhaps uh, sooner or later, Hong Kong government is going to regulate, tighten up the control 
of our cyber domain and the information control. And actually, without Apple Daily and other major media, and we are already in in somehow uh, information vacuum that Hong Kong people can not find very authentic information, and so many disinformation are being generated by the CCP machines uh, in Hong Kong. So how can we counter this kind of influence operation? How can we counter this kind of disinformation? Can private sector uh, have a role on this issue? So HKDC is trying really hard, I mean, uh, in the future, trying to work with private sector to ensure that uh, they will not, I mean, work with uh, the CCP uh, to protect Hong Kong people, to protect other I mean, victims under the CCP. So I think this is one of the direction we have been uh, trying to do. And I think Anna can provide another perspective of what HKDC has been doing. Please, Anna, go ahead. Right. So right now, you know, HKDC, as Sunny said, in the very beginning of 2019 was mostly focused on advocacy. But since everyone has to go into exile right now, we have to expand our work into, you know, three different pillars. So that would be advocacy, diaspora and research. And for advocacy and research, I think they are very closely connected because researchers do inform what we do in advocacy. So, for example, recently, uh, HADC published this uh, report on political prisoners in Hong Kong, because even though Hong Kong is this international financial city, but in the past, you know, two and three years, we represent you know, become the city with a thousand, more than 1,000 political prisoners, which was just unthinkable for me like five years ago. And I think that was a really uh, very succinct research to provide materials for our advocacy on uh, providing humanitarian pathways for Hong Kongers to come to the United States. Because uh, even though the United States and, you know, people around the world do recognize that Hong Kongers are under very imminent threats by the Chinese, uh, Chinese Communist Party, um, there are still a lot of Hong Kongers stuck in Hong Kong. Uh, they cannot really do anything besides waiting at home and waiting to be arrested if one day, you know, the police decide to go back to th their file from like two years ago and to arrest them for saying something on Facebook, let's say. <coughs> Sorry. So that is why. <clears throat> so that is why that a lot of Hong Kongers are still looking to leave Hong Kong. And definitely because the United States has been a beacon of democracy and freedom. So they have been actually waiting and really wanting to come, come to the U.S. And actually a few friends of mine who are Hong Kongers who managed to come to the U.S., they have swiftly joined the U.S. Army just because they fear that one day even the U.S. has to confront uh, the Chinese government so directly. And that's why we really think that having Hong Kongers here would be very powerful and very um, productive allies for the U.S. to recognize how uh, the competition against China could be manifested in different ways. It's not just about, you know, the economics or, you know, uh, diplomatic reasons or human rights concerns. Even. It is really a cross-dimension conflict. Gotcha. Well, one of the main ways that, uh, you know, the United States could uh, um, help Hong Kongers who are fleeing uh, the repression would by be by passing one of these many bills out there that provides for increased uh, uh, protections for Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kongers to relocate to the United States or for them, for Hong Kongers with special skills to uh, be granted more visas, uh, which would also boost American competitiveness. Sonny, you and I have talked about this a lot. All of these bills are now being thrown into the overall China competition bill, which is now stalled, is now totally uh, ground up in partisan politics. And, you know, Republicans in the Senate like Ted Cruz have been against these bills anyway because they're, you know, they are tangentially related to the issues of immigration. Uh, so what's going on in Congress, Sonny? How, how do we convince Democrats, Republicans, and the administration to to take some of this legislation and use it to help Hong Kongers who need that help right now? Yeah, I think um, this is another very good question. I, I just want to, I mean, resonate with Anna that um, we are thinking, I mean, how to uh, connect, I mean, the U.S. national interests, national security issues with uh, Hong Kong, and of course, I mean, many other uh, human rights issues. I think they, they, are, they are quite attached to it. Because, I mean, speaking of I mean, humanitarian pathways, of course, we understand how difficult it can be 
I mean, to pass any humanitarian uh, uh, policies uh, in, uh, in the in the U.S. Congress. I mean, throughout the history, throughout I mean the past few decades. I mean, it's not easy uh, for both House and Senate, uh, for the people who serve in the Judiciary Committee, to pass anything uh, to help uh, this kind of uh, uh, victims under communism or victims under CCP. Even uh, many senators and congressmen, they have been really vocal about Hong Kong or, or, or Uyghurs. However, when it comes to this kind of um, safe harbor policy, uh, uh, this kind of refugee issues, they might be quite conservative. And the reason for that is because they cannot try to, I mean, connect and try to bring in uh, the U.S. national interest dimension to understand uh, uh, this kind of policy. I think, I mean, uh, uh, U.S., I mean, in U.S. history uh, during the Cold War, I mean, so many Vietnamese and also, I mean, uh, for, uh, many Jewish people, I mean, they have been relocating to the U.S. Many talented people, they understand the communism uh, very well. They understand autocracy very well. They have to flee their uh, motherland. They have to flee uh, their home country to come to the U.S. And they can be a really, uh, 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 I mean, uh, uh, an asset to the U.S. national interest to enrich uh, uh, the insights to provide, to benefits, to facilitate uh, the U.S. Uh, national interest. So I think uh, we need to highlight and pinpoint why it is important for the U.S. Uh, uh, national interest uh, uh, to help Hong Kong people and other people who understand CCP very well. And on the other hand, we also have to understand that um, although it seems to us that um, the demise of Hong Kong civil society, at least for the coming years, is inevitable and is actually happening. We still have to be, I mean, we, we still have to discern that there are a lot of means that can be utilized uh, to help Hong Kong or try to use Hong Kong as a leverage to put uh, more pressure on Beijing government. For example, till now, even till now, uh, even, I mean, uh, uh, um, the previous uh, U.S. administration, they abolish a lot of treaties and, and they even uh, 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 cancel the recognition of Hong Kong as a special custom area in the eyes of the U.S. administration. So technically and legally speaking, Hong Kong is, I mean, the same as a very normal and ordinary city uh, uh, in China. Hong Kong no longer enjoy this kind of so-called uh, very uh, uh, ex exclusive, distinctive economic benefits in the U.S. perspective. However, uh, Hong Kong still enjoys a lot of uh, WTO benefits and USCC, a very uh, profound um, uh, US uh, Congress Commission last November, I think uh, they recommend that perhaps the US should try to refocus um, the Hong Kong uh, WTO membership status because uh, Hong Kong has lost its political autonomy and becomes more conform with the Beijing economic interests. How can Hong Kong then as a very normal political entity and then to have a unique membership status in the WTO to provide more benefits for the CCP. This doesn't make any sense, right? But of course, I mean, uh, is that really feasible? How can we cancel Hong Kong uh, WTO membership status? That is another matter. But, uh, but, but, uh, but what I want to address is that we can still find ways to use Hong Kong as a political and economic leverage to put pressure uh, on Beijing. And we have to be mindful that uh, we should not give up uh, on Hong Kong because there are still a lot of things we can uh, do for Hong Kong. Got it. And uh, let me ask you about that because it seems that there are a lot of things Congress is probably not going to act on Hong Kong, if we're being honest, but there are a lot of things that the U.S. government, the Biden administration could do on its own that they could probably do today. What are some things that they could do right now that would help? And do you ag agree that you know, in order to, that we should treat Taiwan, I'm sorry, Hong Kong, like every other Chinese city in terms of uh, trade and economics? Uh, or do, are you concerned that that would only really hurt Hong Kongers by hurting the Hong Kong economy even more? Um, that is definitely a great question, because I think in the past, a lot of the efficacy efforts are mostly based on what the Congress can do. But actually, there's only so much that the Congress can do, especially when we are kind of in a political gridlock situation in D.C. And I guess a lot of, 
of people in the audience know very, you know, clearly about what I mean uh, about the politics and how, uh, for example, immigration uh, debate has been a very deep rooted problem in the uh, political system of the U.S. And that is why I think um, at HADC, we're also trying to turn the effort and turn our attention into what the Biden, Biden administration can do. So the first thing that they can do is actually they can immediately grant, you know, TPS or even P2 refugee status for Hong Kongers. And that would be a very effective re uh, um, scheme to actually help people who are under the threat of political prosecution to come to the U.S. And of course, as uh, Sunny and I have said earlier that, you know, I believe that Hong Kongers, if they do get the chance to come to the U.S., they are not just here to, you know, um, they're, they're actually here to want to continue to fight against the CCP and they will find whatever ways that they can uh, to devise new strategy and new uh, innovations to connect different fronts and to fight uh, against the CCP together. And secondly, I think uh, what the Biden administration can do is definitely sanctioning uh, Hong Kong government officials and even prosecutors in Hong Kong. And recently the CCC uh, in Congress have published a report uh, detailing some policy recommendation they have for the administration to exercise the sanction power that was authorized by the Congress uh, one or two years ago through the Hong Kong Autonomy Act. So actually, uh, the administration does have the executive power to sanction these officials and these prosecutors who directly uh, inflicted a lot of harm and damage to our Hong Konger people and also to our society. But then the administration is not really, um, you know, exercising that power. And actually, I think earlier this year, we had some meetings and conversations with people who worked at the State Department. And we did ask how come, you know, the power is not yet exercised uh, regarding sanctioning. And the response we got back then was that uh, there was not enough of a political will by uh, the government to really use their power. And of course, being an activist and being an advocacy organization, when you hear an answer like that, uh, the thing that you can do is to create that political will for them, right? So that is why we want to continue with uh, campaigning how China is actually a bad actor and also a tr an untrustworthy, uh, really uh, global player in the international realm so that the United States uh, or the Biden administration would not feel that they would have to continue some sort of negotiation or diplomatic ties with them uh, in the cost with the cost of human rights issue just to continue some sort of agreement with them. Because with Hong Kong as the case study, uh, you can see that one country, two system was a very well put agreement. It was, you know, drafted, it was negotiated, and it was uh, discussed by so many experts and professionals across, uh, uh, across regions. But still, it turned out to be an agreement that did not mean anything. Because when China, when the Chinese Communist Party comes to play, you can guarantee that the agreement is not going to be an agreement, it's just going to be a piece of paper that they are welcome or they're free to interpret you know in any way that they wish so i think if we can make this message clear to the biden administration then they would perhaps uh, recognize that actually there are things and there are human rights uh, atrocities going on right now if they don't do anything anymore and if they still buy on uh, buy into that uh, fantasy that the ccp is going to be democratized and it's going to be a well-behaved international player so these are some things that uh, we want to do and regarding your point about how that might uh, affect or uh, negatively impact uh, hong kongers on the ground for example when sanction is placed i Sorry, I can confidently say that actually a lot of Hong Kongers don't care. They actually think that they're already living in hell because they're not given the right. They're not, you know, um, allowed to really speak or live the way they want. So why does it matter that, you know, some government officials are sanctioned or the economics is going to, you know, go bad? Because right now, as you can see, uh, Hong Kong is already... Uh, suffering from kind of an economic decline and financial decline just because uh, how the CCP is trying to shift uh, the financial and economic focus uh, or uh, the significance to uh, cities like Shanghai and Shenzhen, like cities that they have more trust in. So I would say that Hong Kongers don't really care about this temporary uh, hit that they're going to take as long as we get a path that can bring us to true freedom and true democracy.
Got it. Thank you. Well, you know, Sonny, let me ask you about what Anna just said, which is I found shocking. The State Department won't sanction Hong, Hong Kong leaders because there's not the political will, meaning that there's not enough pressure on the U.S. government to care. So how do we up that pressure? And what can people around the country, regular Americans who want to uh, help up that pressure, what can they do? Uh, and how do we get how do we get this White House's attention while they're dealing with Ukraine and, you know, Saudi Arabia and, you know, God knows what else? I think um, um, the situation right now is also quite complex in a way that um, there are so many reasons that, con- that, that I mean, that contribute to the current, I mean, uh, political deadlock. I mean, uh, if I would say um, uh, on Hong Kong policies and also perhaps I mean even on the China policy, because I mean we always know that I mean uh, and notice that uh, perhaps in the U.S. administration, in the State Department, uh, in the NSC, there are a lot of uh, tensions. There are a lot of debate, uh, if not speed, uh, regarding the China China policies. Uh, previously, um, I mean the trade representative might have some uh, dispute with the with Sullivan, I mean, regarding the, 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 the tariff issues, right? And then uh, regarding Hong Kong, they might even not uh, prioritize Hong Kong as their very uh, uh, top priority right now because the whole U.S. administration right now might be, I mean, focusing on the domestic policies and the invasion problem, etc., right? So many things ongoing, I mean, going on uh, uh, in the U.S. So, um. However, I, I still think that I mean, uh, we have to we have to I mean have a very very um, clear picture. Uh, how should we prioritize uh, this kind of uh, goals and 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 our political uh, means? Uh, if we really consider China as our biggest threat, uh, if we really believe that I mean we are going to have a very keen strategic competition with China, then we have to show that we have to use concrete actions to prove that. Uh, this is not just empty words. So, uh, we we uh, we of course we hope that I mean we can provide more political will. We will keep saying these issues. Uh, we will keep pushing the Congress to focus on uh, Hong Kong and China. But on the other hand, we should uh, also um, speak with the American public to know that um, how China issue, how Hong Kong, how this kind of uh, human rights uh, violation uh, actually also uh, impact and will undermine eventually. Uh, the, the the fundamental rights and fundamental political belief of uh, American. So I think we have to draw these references, and also we have to uh, n- let the policymakers in the State Department, in the NSC, to know that uh, we should not. I mean, trying to have any fantasy that uh, the Chinese government uh, is going to. I mean, uh, uh, we less their uh, wolf warrior diplomacy. We should not. Uh, believe in the CCP diplomacy, and we should be ready, be more assertive, uh, uh, to handle the uh, 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 the China issues and try to ensure that Hong Kong and Uyghurs and Tibetans or, or or Taiwanese people will be the top priority of the of the administration uh, uh, to to handle with and try to provide more uh, concrete action and help. Excellent. And just before we go to questions, Anna, same question to you. How do we get? The U.S. government to care. How do we get Americans to understand that this affects them? What's your argument to Americans about why they should spend their time and energy and enthusiasm to help the people of Hong Kong? That reminds me, actually, of a slogan we used back in 2019 when I was doing the global newspaper ad campaign, which is that. Uh, if we fall, you fall with us. That was the slogan we used. Kind of corny, but I think there's some truth to it, is that um, Hong Kong being this international financial city with so many you know, international corporations headquarters stationed in Hong Kong was supposedly to, be, to have a certain level of freedom and autonomy so that businesses can conduct uh, their you know, matters very safely there with a certain degree of security. But in the 2019 movement, I think it really showed that uh, for a lot of companies or even other governments that um, money comes first. And it's not only about money, but immediate money comes first. That in the sense that even if uh, the sort of collaboration or cooperation they have in China will pan out 
to be a total loss in ten years' time. People will still be very tempted、uh, to get their, you know, first pot of gold first by doing business with China. And I think that was what a lot of Hong Kongers saw in 2019. That we really wanted to remind people and tell people to stop falling for that trap because Hong Kong was actually、uh, one of the first. Uh, international financial city to believe、uh, to fall into the trap that we rely in、uh, on China so much、uh, economically, financially, but of course there were also political reasons. But eventually, we、uh, came to the situation where we cannot stop depending on the CCP and China, right? And I think that is a very valuable lesson for everyone around the world to learn. Is not only for businesses or governments to learn, but for everyone, because you can see、uh, actively and with news every day that the CCP is actually trying、uh, to even censor what people can say outside of China, and they're trying to take away. Take away the freedom of expression of people, you know, transnationally, and I think that is something very alarming, because as we are talking about how China is, you know, being an, a bad actor and how it's、uh, conducting human rights atrocity around the world,、uh, you can still see a lot, a lot, a lot of companies doing,、uh, you know. Uh, businesses with China every day, and it's making China, you know, stronger and stronger economically, so that it has more leverage、uh, over other governments. And eventually, it's going to influence the policies of different governments. So it will, it, it, you know, eventually harm the interest of the people、uh, in other countries, even though they were not aware of these、uh, deals with the devil, if I may say. So I think really、uh, the way to convince people is to say is to illustrate how Hong Kong, even though we were an international financial city and、uh, under you know the spotlight of so many international media, still we went through、uh, that that hell and we went through that process of descending into a territory under the complete control of China. And I think that is something that the world should learn about, and they should really. Stop、uh, fantasizing that China is going to cooperate on the international front because everything they do is just for show, and that is just for to gain trust from people so that they can become a bad actor and to betray on、uh, agreements later on. Yes, thank you. All, with aggressive totalitarian dictatorships, the appetite grows with the eating. And they don't stop expanding until confronted.、Uh, thank you both. Now let me turn it back to Ayame, who will moderate our question and answer. Hi, thanks, Josh. Thanks,、uh, Sunny and Anna, for this wonderful discussion.、Um, I just got a few questions from the、uh, Twitter. If there is anybody who'd like to ask questions, you can also raise your hand.、Um, otherwise, I will just ask these. Uh, the first question, and anybody can answer, is:、uh, Given the recent UN Human Rights Committee meeting with the Hong Kong delegation, viewing the current situation in Hong Kong for the first time since China imposed a national security law, what measures do you expect the UN Human Rights Committee to take in response to the concerns they raise, and what does this mean for the next steps in Hong Kong's struggle to hold Beijing accountable? What are the most urgent issues to tackle first? Right, so I can share a bit about that. So、uh, HADC actually also did an ICCPR submission、uh, to the UN based off of、uh, our political prisoner report, and in that report, we definitely, you know, mentioned、uh, the freedom of expression, assembly, political participation, and such and such. But when we actually did the submission,、uh, I don't think we. Fantasize, or we thought that you know, with just one submission, we can create or start、uh, fundamental changes within the party or with the government. But I think what stood out to me is that、um, I really wanted to know, you know, what the government was going to respond and how they were going to、uh, talk about the allegations the international society had for them.、Uh, that was definitely one thing because. Um, even though the government, the Chinese and Hong Kong government have been very aggressive, and they have been pretty, you know,、um, bold with、uh, how unreasonable their claims are, there is still a certain limit that they try to play within, and they try to, you know, follow some sort of framework. And you can see in、uh, the UN system that they have been trying to. Uh, redefine what it means to be, for example, democracy and human rights, and these are actually very dangerous. I would say、uh, 
uh, strategies from them because once they have enough of uh, an influence to really redefine these terms, a lot of things can change in the international system of you know UN or other uh, organizations. So I think that was definitely something is that we have to keep contesting their idea of democracy, their freedom, and how they really define a different level of government uh, governance and how they try to limit people's freedom. And on another hand, I think uh, the work at UN is, even though I would say a lot of Hong Kongers have a quite strong distrust in the UN system, that they don't really expect any change to happen in there. But still, the UN is seen by uh, the Chinese government as a very uh, hostile battleground, that they really try to win their fights there by redefining a lot of the words and by challenging people uh, when they come up with a strong case. So I think there is a certain importance to keep Hong Kong's case in the UN just to keep the topic going and just to tell the world that, hey, we're still here. And uh, it's not gonna change that we'll continue to fight until we can find a path to build the Hong Kong we want to see. Great, thank you so much. Any, anybody else wanna add to that? Otherwise I'll go into the next question. Um, so another question is, um, it's no secret that the number of political prisoners in Hong Kong continues to climb at startling rates, with young people being disproportionately targeted. How, does this, um, how has this affected the movement and your generation's ability to operate under the national security law? Uh, have tactics changed from before versus after the national security law was implemented? Yeah, perhaps I can start with that. I mean, um, that is another very fantastic question. Uh, I would say um, people in Hong Kong, I mean, both uh, local and overseas, they uh, have been, I mean, trying uh, really hard to, um, I mean, um, to, to fight for uh, the space for a very authentic and covert education programs to ensure that um, the legacy of the movement and uh, uh, the, the history of Hong Kong people can be uh, uh, sustained and can be uh, uh, disseminated uh, later on. I mean, a full generation, generation by generations. So I think that is also why we want to highlight that we need to ensure that um, we have the information access, we have freedom of information uh, in Hong Kong and in overseas. For example, when there are some documentaries regarding the Hong Kong movement are being banned and Hong Kong children, the next generation cannot pop, uh, I mean, properly to, um, to enter a cinema and theater to watch the Hong Kong documentary. And when, when they can no longer borrow some books uh, in the public libraries regarding Hong Kong uh, uh, protests, they can no longer borrow books from uh, uh, written by uh, Jimmy Lai, Joshua Wong, and, and Professor Benny Tai, and that means they really lack this kind of channels to understand uh, what Hong Kong was uh, in the previous years. So uh, we have to ensure that uh, if Hong Kong government ban this kind of information, then we can revive and restore this kind of information in uh, in overseas. Uh, as long as they, I mean, as long as I mean after COVID. When parents they can I mean bring their kids and children to travel to Taiwan to UK to the US if there is a sort of a museum uh, built by the Hong Kong diaspora we can uh, tell them what is the cover history uh, of Hong Kong we can try to protect our own culture and identity uh, through this kind of ways and means so it takes years it takes some time but we are trying hard to do that otherwise uh, is of course I mean it will be a very huge challenge for us to ensure our next generation not being brainwashed uh, by the Communist Party. Great, thank you so much for that, Sunny. Um, and you mentioned Jimmy Lai and Joshua Wong. Another question is, have you, uh, I think for all of you, uh, been able to contact some of the political prisoners currently in Hong Kong, for example, Jimmy Lai and Joshua Wong and others? Yes, yeah, Sunny, do you want to go first or? Uh, yeah, sure. I, I just want to give a very uh, brief remark on that. I mean, um, there are actually no ways for us, I mean, to 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 um, to um talk to them, to communicate with them, because, I mean, uh, uh, the surveillance is uh, really uh, 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 severe and, and uh, it's really difficult for us. I mean, I mean, to protect them, 
uh, and also to protect the families. So we 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 don't have this kind of channels to talk to them. But of course, I mean they can still write letters. Uh, they still uh, sometimes uh, uh, update. Uh, they have updates on their social medias. So I think through this kind of channels, we can understand more about their lives. But I can. Uh, uh, I, I can. What 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 I can say is that the well beings of political prisoners in prison right now are not good at all, because uh, many examples and many people already noticed that the Hong Kong Correctional Service, which is I mean the department, the agency who is responsible and in charge of the Hong Kong prisons, um, uh, is going to introduce and implement. Yeah, they have implemented a lot of um uh, ways to uh, monitor the political prisoners already. Um, uh, they even import the model of uh, some Xinjiang concentration camp. They want to de-radicalize uh, the political prisoners. They want to, uh, uh, they want to uh, implement the AI uh, uh, surveillance cameras uh, into Hong Kong prisons to ensure that each corner, every corner of the prison, uh, of that prison uh, will be monitored and uh, no, no one can uh, have any uh, 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 provocative means uh, uh, to 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 induce any unrest in the prison. So I think uh, the Hong Kong uh, 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 it will be more difficult for them to communicate with the outside world. Uh, we can imagine and anticipate that. So I think that is also why uh, we hope the U.S. government and also uh, the UN uh, human rights committees and other uh, free world countries can. Uh, I mean, keep highlighting, keep addressing uh, the human rights issue in Hong Kong. Great, thank you. And Anna, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I think Sunny summarized it pretty well that, um, you know, the well-being of political prisoners right now is uh, very undesirable the conditions that they're living under in and it's really concerning that the government has been trying to tighten up the control inside of prison and a lot of the times uh, when people try to make inquiries about what is going on inside the prison uh, they they are not able to get an answer and even if they get an answer it's very difficult to verify whether it's an honest answer or not and I think even back in 2019 uh, there were a lot of rumors and I think uh, most Hong Kongers think uh, would say it's true that uh, there were a lot of ab abuses either uh, violent abuses or sexual abuses happening inside of these prisons and back then there was a very uh, there was um, a very famous prison that was known for these kind of tortures. But I think right now we can expect uh, to see it in more places. And that is that is definitely a very disheartening thing uh, to hear about. But I think another thing um, that got me thinking is that uh, right now, since there's really limited uh, channels to communicate between people inside of the prison and people outside of prison, uh, it's very difficult for people inside of prison to maintain faith that people are waiting for them outside. And I think that really, uh, you know, hit the core of the people because they are afraid that they will be forgotten. And that's why a lot of Hong Kongers try to write uh, letters uh, to people in prison, even if they don't know them, they'll write letters about, you know, their daily updates and to make sure that uh, people who are jailed know that they're not forgotten. And I think that is, um, people are still trying to do it, but it's difficult to know how long it can last because the government can just end, you know, any uh, letter going in for political prisoners at any point. So I think right now the situation it's really grim. And with that in mind, uh, it's more, even more difficult to have a coherent sense of Hong Kong just because we no longer share so many communication channels. So one thing I've been saying is that I think in the following decade to come, if Hong Kong will not be liberated by then, we will probably see you know, several different Hong Kongs uh, in parallel to each other. So the first Hong Kong we see would be you know, the Hong Kong that we're uh, people in Hong Kong is experiencing um, you know, how some people are jailed, some people are waiting outside you know, desperately, and how there cannot be uh, freedom of expression or any space for organizing, really. But then there's also this other Hong Kong that the Hong Kong government is trying to introduce, which is a very prosperous uh, financial center that uh, people can do business in. But of course, we know it's just a disguise of the authoritarian and dictatorship that's going on in Hong Kong. But also there would be the Hong Kong's outside uh, 
you know, the in the diaspora, there would be various new ideas of Hong Kong being birthed here. So I think, very realistically speaking, one of the problems that our uh, Hong Kong Hong Konger as a collective is going to face is that there will be different uh, ideas or concepts of Hong Kong, and eventually people would have to discuss and negotiate and see which Hong Kong would be the one we want to move forward with. And that's why uh, HADC is also actually uh, hosting a Hong Kong summit this weekend, just to sort out uh, these very difficult questions among the diasporic members. But of course, right now, it's very, very difficult to have uh, a collective or representatives that can really discuss Hong Kong as a whole, because everyone is just seeing a piece of what it means. And that is why I think it's faced by a lot of diaspora, but hopefully I, I hope that um, Hong Kong can be liberated soon and we can eventually get home and be with everyone again. Great, thank you so much. Uh, we're right at six, but if you have like a very quick uh, final call to action or message you'd like to share, uh, last minute. <laughs> I'd just like to say uh, um, thank you to both Sunny and Anna for keeping the fight alive. It's clear that the struggle for Hong Kong's freedom and democracy is not over. In fact, it's just beginning and it could last a very long time and we all need to stay engaged and keep our eye on the, the goal, which is uh, freedom, democracy and human rights for the people of Hong Kong uh, as a bulwark for the freedom and democracy and human rights of people everywhere. Yeah, and um, on behalf of HRF, thank you again, Josh, Anna, Sunny, for joining us today and sharing with us what's happening in Hong Kong now and providing us with the tools and knowledge we need to help empower civil society and some support Hong Kong's pro-democracy movement. If you enjoyed today's discussion, please give them a follow on Twitter and be sure to tune into HRF's next Twitter space conversation. Thank you and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you so much.